10 gigabit network connection can significantly speed up network file copies and other network operations. But why stop at 10 gigabit? Today I'm going to be taking a look at a 40 gigabit NIC, take a look at hardware and software configurations that allow it to work the best, and see how much faster it can make operations compared to a 10 gigabit network connection in a home lab environment. Thanks to Unix Surplus for providing this hardware and the cables required for these network cards to work for this video. Check them out in the links below if you want to buy network cards like this or other cool server hardware. Let's first take a look at the hardware I'm going to be working with today. This is a PCI Express card that allows you to add 40 gigabit to almost any system. It plugs into the system with a PCIe Gen 3 X8 slot, but if you're only using one port like I am today, you can max out a single port using this in either a PCIe Gen 3 X4 configuration or in a Gen 2 X8 slot. The two ports on this card are QSFP Plus ports. If you've worked with SFP Plus ports, these are likely fairly familiar as you have a large transceiver that plugs into it. But compared to an SFP Plus transceiver, a QSFP Plus transceiver is significantly bigger because there's quite a bit more going on inside here. And essentially 40 gigabit is kind of like having four 10 gigabit connections. Because if you open up this transceiver, you can see that there's actually eight data links, four send and four receive in four pairs on this link. And you can actually buy some transceivers that take these QSFP Plus connectors and split them out into four SFP Plus connectors to plug into multiple other systems. But with the disadvantage of all these different options QSFP Plus gives you, also means you have a lot more things to pick from and think through when setting up cables. Unlike RJ45 where you just plug it in and hope it links at the fastest possible speed if a cable is good quality, there's a lot of different possible transceivers. Some options include direct attached copper cables like this one here for SFP Plus, which have just a little copper cable that connects it. I'm going to be using a active optical cable, this one here. It's like a direct attached copper cable where there's QSFP Plus connectors on both ends and they're permanently attached so you can't take the fibers out. But unlike a direct attached copper cable, it's fiber optics in the middle, which is more flexible and a smaller cable compared to copper and allows for high, longer distances. So this is a five meter cable, which is pretty long for a direct attached copper cable, but active optical cables can go a bit longer. If you want to do more fancy setups, you can get transceivers to plug in your own fiber optic cables of multiple different types. But QSFP Plus gets even more complicated than SFP Plus with many different types, depending on the types of fiber optics you want to run and how long you want to run and a lot more. And I'm not going to be getting into that today, but that's just a quick primer on setting up QSFP Plus connections. Now let's get into actually using it and my experience setting it up. So I just first started off with a basic setup. I took my current desktop that I use for video editing and other desktop tasks, which has a i9-12900K on a Z690 motherboard, and I plugged it into an old LGA 2011 server system. I put a handful of SSDs in RAID 0 that should be able to achieve very high speeds, and set up a 40 gigabit connection between both of the nodes. And here's a crystal disk mark I got using Samba shares, and it's better than 10 gigabit, but it's far from what I'd expect 40 gigabit connections to be able to give me. So now I went on this quest of how can I actually reach the limit of 40 gigabit? I had a lot of different hardware and software tweaks to play with, but the first thing I did was just kind of take a look at this system and see what might be the limiting factor. One thing that often is the limit with these higher speed network connections is single threaded performance. Network connections like 40 gigabit have been increasing in speed much faster than CPU single threaded performance have. So often single threaded performance is a major limitation. And if you're looking on a Linux system, looking for something at about 100% CPU usage means it's maxing out a single thread on the processor. If you're using something like HTOP, you can also see the little graph. And that likely means there's something running in a single thread. Tools like iPerf allow you to run multiple streams and see how much faster you can go with multiple streams enabled. One cool thing I discovered is SMB with an SMB server on Linux uses multi-channel by default with these cards, which is a really nice feature because it allows you to have multiple streams and spread it out across multiple CPU cores. This is using receive side scaling it looks like and if I run the git SMB multi-channel on my system it just shows that it's enabled. SMB multi-channel is typically used for connections where you have multiple physical network connections, but it also works with these higher speed necks where it essentially treats it as multiple connections. But iPerf still wasn't able to maximize the connection, so I thought maybe there's still some sort of CPU limitation. So I got a newer server to play with. This server had an LGA 2011-3 system, which had a faster CPU, faster memory, and was just an overall newer, faster platform. 
I put the network card in, plugged it into my same desktop, and I got a bit higher speeds, but still not 40 gigabit. Though iPerf was showing higher speeds, showing how this newer system was able to essentially fully take advantage of this network connection. But Samba still wasn't. So I thought, maybe there's still more single-threaded limits or something like that, so throw more hardware at the problem. And about the same speeds. I tried a 5950X, which is near as fast as you can get when it comes to single-threaded performance on a CPU, and maybe slightly better, but not significantly better. And this is when I was thinking, there got to be some software tuning I have to do to get the full speed out of these network cards. And it turned out the trick that allowed me to get this result here in Crystal Disk Mark was turning the MTU up. The default on Ethernet is typically about 1500, which is the maximum amount of frame size in bits. I turned it up to 9000, which allows for bigger frames, which means fewer frames, and fewer frames means less CPU overhead. And it turns out when I turn this knob, Crystal Disk Mark showed much higher results, and copying files around was much faster. So, I can get the full out of these connections without really much tuning, which was really nice to see. The next question I had was, if turning the MTU got such a big speed increase on my 5950X system, maybe I just have to do that on my older LGA 2011-3 server and get those speed increases. And it was a little better on my LGA 2011-3 system, but I still couldn't get the maximum level of performance that I got on my 5950X. So from what it looks like here, from my configuration, having a newer, faster CPUs and turning MTU down increased the speed. And this is along with Samba's multi-channel capabilities, which was spreading it across CPU cores. And while this is a little bit more configuration, this was still pretty easy to set up, and I was actually impressed how good of performance I was able to get with relatively little setup. But this is just Crystal Disk Mark results, and all my testing was being done from a RAM disk, so I didn't have an SSD as a possible limitation. When I start putting SSDs into the mix, I realize even SSDs like these that are rated for faster than 40 gigabits of performance are relatively hard to maximize. And my workstation, while it's reasonably fast, doesn't have SSDs that can typically maximize those either. Just because SSDs can only hit their maximum performance in certain workloads for certain periods of time, and often with a lot of SSDs, especially consumer-grade drives, they slow down significantly after filling the first little bit of data up on them and their SLC cache is filled. And while it is super impressive seeing these massive sequential speeds on these 40 gigabit network connections, a lot of the times with random I.O., you won't be maxing out a 10 gigabit connection, or sometimes even a 1 gigabit connection's worth of bandwidth. So I wanted to try to see how these different types of network connections differ when it comes to more random and latency-dependent workloads. And in my random I.O. testing, they were pretty much on par. 40 gigabit was always about the same speed of 10 gigabit or slightly faster in all of my testing here. So there's really no benefit to going to 40 gigabit if random I.O. is your main bottleneck, at least with this simple SMB and NFS testing that I did. I also put 1 gigabit in just out of curiosity of how that would compare, as my file bandwidth was less than what 1 gigabit is capable of doing and 1 gigabit has significantly slower speeds. The other thing is these ConnectX3 and newer network cards support features like ROC over E, which uses RDMA and other features for faster network transfers. As I was already starting to see the limitations of single thread performance and other CPU overheads, these newer 40 gig and much faster network cards have to do a lot more tricks to get much higher speeds. And I likely want to do a video on those tricks to get much higher speeds using RDMA and other features videos in the future, but today I was kind of looking at 40 gig as just kind of a plug and play and just see how it works in that type of environment. I also want to talk for a little bit about 40 gigabit Ethernet and its position in the market. 40 gigabit seems to be getting replaced by 50 and 100 gigabit in new switches and equipment. There's still plenty of 40 gigabit equipment out there on the used market that you can pick up and use for fairly cheap, but it likely means that new switches aren't coming out with 40 gigabit as their primary port speeds though many of these new switches that support 100 gigabit or 50 gigabit also support linking at 40 gigabit if you have existing equipment. With the current prices these network cards are going for, I think it can make a lot of sense if you're close to filling up 10 gigabit and want the potential for a bit more speeds. Just be aware that you will have much less options in switches compared to 10 gigabit, and also transceivers are likely going to have much less options or they're going to be much more expensive than 10 gigabit transceivers also. I'm curious what speeds you're running in your home lab and how much you're using your network connections up. 
let me know in the comments below, and thanks for watching this video.